Our solar system. It is one of only billions of other planetary systems in the Milky Way. It is of course centred by the Sun, a G2 main sequence star, and has eight planets orbiting it. There are four inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, and four outer gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. It is located roughly 27,000 light years away from the galactic center in one of its spiral arms known as the Orion Cygnus arm in a stable orbit where one rotation takes roughly 225 million years. All of the planets in our solar system have stable, mostly circular orbits around our sun, but it hasn't always been that way. When we look at other solar systems, we see many planets in different orbital configurations and positions relative to their parent star. Some have very elliptical orbits, behaving in a similar way to comets. Some just have a large single gas giant planet that dominates its system. Many have planets that orbit very close to their stars, often closer than that of Mercury, and have masses that put them into the super-Earth or Neptune-like category. But from what we've currently discovered, there are not very many solar systems like our own. So that begs the question, how did our solar system form? What made the conditions necessary during the solar system formation for Earth to be habitable? This is what this video is out to explain. There are several different theories into how the solar system as we see it today formed, and there is not a uniform consensus into the finer details, but I shall present the most generally accepted one that is in accordance with the latest research. Around 4.56 billion years ago, in a star forming region, likely from a planetary nebula, hydrogen gas within the nebula is perturbed, possibly from a nearby supernova event, and then begins to coalesce into a single point. This blob of hydrogen then starts to have a gravitational influence on the surrounding gas, becoming denser and starts to rotate into a disc-like shape because of its angular momentum. It accumulates more and more gas until after 100,000 years, where it has enough mass to be classified as a protostar. This is our young sun. At this stage, none of the planets have formed yet. They are still pieces of dust, orbiting in a large protoplanetary disk, not too dissimilar from what the star HL Tauri currently looks like. For the next 400,000 years, it continues to hoover up the remaining material in its vicinity. Once it's all gone, the Sun is now a pre-main sequence star, better known as a T Tauri star. It is rotating very quickly, within 1 to 12 days. It is also larger than it is today, but it is slowly contracting, the core slowly putting enough pressure and temperature to initiate hydrogen fusion. This stage at most will last 100 million years. It is during the T Tauri phase that our solar system starts to take shape. The dust orbiting our sun begins to accrete and coalesce, at first sticking together piece by piece rather than violently colliding with each other, forming small clumps of rock and ice known as planetesimals. One of these clumps, possibly at a distance of 3.5 astronomical units, was becoming large enough to have a gravitational influence on other planetesimals nearby. It then started to accumulate mass rather rapidly. The more it gained, the larger its influence became until it was massive enough to hold on to hydrogen gas from the protoplanetary disk. This was the beginnings of the formation of Jupiter. Its orbit, however, was not stable during this period. Not all planetesimals near Jupiter would collide with it, many being ejected into the outer solar system or into interstellar space. Though very small compared to Jupiter, they still had a small gravitational pull of their own that influenced the giant planet ever so slightly. So for every ejected planetesimal, Jupiter would slowly and gradually migrate inwards towards the Sun. And this is known as the Grand Tack Hypothesis. This process continued, all while Jupiter was gaining more and more mass from the disk. At one point, colliding with a turn earth mass protoplanet, which disrupted the composition of Jupiter's core. It eventually reached a distance of roughly 1.5 astronomical units, the present day orbit on Mars. A second planet formed further out and started doing the same thing, moving inwards towards the Sun. This is the beginning of Saturn. 
Eventually it reached a point where they caught each other in a 3-2 resonance. This is where for every three times Jupiter orbits the Sun, Saturn orbits twice. This propelled both planets to reverse course and start migrating outwards, as they now inject the majority of their planetesimals towards the inner part of the solar system instead, as well as being gravitationally influenced by each other. This eventually pulled Jupiter to its present day orbit at 5.2 astronomical units. The next planets to form were Neptune and Uranus. During this time, Neptune formed closer to the Sun than Uranus had, which explains why it's more massive. Both of their orbits were closer than they are today. Between the orbits of Saturn and Neptune, there was another planet. A fifth giant planet had also formed, likely a mini Neptune with approximately 10 Earth masses. This all occurred within roughly 5 to 10 million years after the Sun's formation. The inner solar system took longer to take shape. When the five giant planets had formed, there were roughly 50 to 100 moon to Mars sized objects, all orbiting within the orbit of Jupiter. During its migration inward, Jupiter perturbed the disk of the inner solar system, disturbing most of the material there and causing many of these small planets to have more eccentric and unstable orbits. Some will be ejected from the system, some will have collided with the Sun and the outer planets. A notable impact was on Uranus, where an Earth-sized planet collided and caused its axial tilt to change to be 97.8 degrees, meaning its poles are facing the Sun and it rotates on its side. Some of the inner protoplanets collided with each other, and there is evidence to suggest that all four terrestrial planets had some form of cataclysmic impact during their past. Mercury was losing a large portion of its mantle, Venus with its retrograde rotation, meaning it spins backwards, suggesting a large impact to hit the planet from an opposite direction of its originally prograde rotation. Mars had its northern hemisphere flattened, possibly from a Pluto-sized object. And Earth had its moon formation impact, and a Mars-sized planet called Phia grazed Earth, crossed the Roche limit and broke up, forming a ring around Earth, which led to the accretion of the moon. It is thought that Phia was an object from the outer solar system, being similar to objects such as Titan and Europa, being mostly comprised of ices and carbonaceous chondrite-like material. This likely was the main source of Earth's water, and it also brought the carbon compounds which are the building blocks of life to Earth, which then led to the conditions for abiogenesis to be possible. These four planets were the survivors from this chaos. The gravitational effects of Jupiter also prevented the possibility of a large terrestrial planet forming between it and Mars, which is the reason for the asteroid belt. There still was some accretion as is shown by the existence of the dwarf planet Ceres, but nothing bigger than that likely emerged. The Kuiper belt was still filled with planetesimals. Objects could accrete to larger sizes in the asteroid belt, but the biggest objects such as Eris form within less than 2,500 kilometers in diameter. Jupiter's inward migration also affected the amount of planet forming material in the inner solar system, which is why no super Earth sized planets formed there, as is common when observing other solar systems. It is also possible that super Earth sized planets did form within our solar system, and then Jupiter caused an increase in their eccentricities, causing collisions between them or led to their ejection from the system, which could explain the generally small size of the terrestrial planets, especially Mars. Without the formation of Saturn, it is also likely Jupiter would have continued to migrate inwards, hoovering up what was left of the disk and having a very close orbit to the Sun, similar to that of the planet 51 Pegasi b, with very high temperatures and would coincidentally be known as a hot Jupiter planet. So you can thank Saturn for our existence. Thank you, Saturn. You did good. After 100 million years, the Sun by now had reached the main sequence. It's now strong stellar winds blotted the remnants of the protoplanetary disk away into the outer solar system, and major planet formation ceased. But this was not the end of the story. We still had five giant planets, and for the next 400 million years or so, the orbits of them remained relatively stable, in a 3-2, 3-2, 2-1, resonance chain. Beyond the orbit of Uranus at this time, there was a large undisturbed disk of planetesimals, 
They were far too far away and spaced out from each other to coalesce to form a large planet out of this material. This was the ancient Kuiper Belt. Ever so gradually, the remaining planetesimals start to have more eccentric orbits, causing them to collide with each other and forming more dust. This dust then starts to lose angular momentum as a result of the solar wind, in what is known as the Pointine Robertson effect. The dust spiraled inward, and then causing the outer planets to migrate outwards in the same way that it caused Jupiter to migrate inwards earlier, and this broke the orbital resonance chain. The most notable changes was in Neptune, Saturn, and the fifth giant. Neptune was the most influenced by the dust and planetesimals. That and close encounters with the other planets caused Neptune's orbit to have the most significant change, being flung out to its present day orbit at roughly 30 astronomical units. It was during this time that it had captured its largest moon, a Kuiper Belt object that we know today as Triton. Saturn started to disrupt the orbit of the fifth giant, with them crossing orbits with each other. Eventually an encounter between the two caused the fifth giant to be propelled inwards, making its orbit very elliptical and crossing the orbit of Jupiter. An encounter with Jupiter then injected the fifth giant into interstellar space, becoming a rogue planet. Or maybe, instead it was flung into the outer reaches of the Kuiper Belt, being the ever so elusive Planet 9 that astronomers have been trying to find, but as of the release of this video, we don't know for certain if it exists. The orbital instability from the giant planets flung many of these planetesimals into the inner solar system, causing a cascade of comets and asteroids to hit the inner planets in what is known as their late heavy bombardment. Some of these objects were rather large. The Caloris Basin on Mercury, for example, was formed from an impactor that was roughly 100 kilometers across during this period. Similar craters have been observed on the Moon, and it is therefore safe to assume that there were far more that hit Earth, but none of the craters have survived to the modern day, as they've been broken down by weathering, erosion, and plate subduction. There are many other bodies that have large craters as a result of the late heavy bombardment, such as on Mars and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. This lasted for roughly 200 million years, ending 3.8 billion years ago. An example of a modern system with similar conditions for this is the F-type star Eta Corvi. The modern solar system mostly as we know it is now here, but it is important to note that there have been a few developments since then. The moon's orbit around Earth was, and still is, slowly getting larger, 2 centimetres a year. 10 to 100 million years ago, a moon of Saturn's got too close to it, passing the Roche limit and broke up, forming Saturn's rings. Occasional large impacts do occur, such as the Chicxulub crater on Earth that helped to wipe out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, but in the grand scheme of things, nothing cataclysmic since the end of the late heavy bombardment. The general quietness and stability of the system then led to Earth having the conditions necessary for life to grow and prosper, resulting in complex life eventually ourselves. In the far distant future, as our sun begins to age and becomes a red giant, it is expected that more orbital instability will take place, mostly with the inner planets, predicting several scenarios where Venus or Mercury could potentially collide with Earth. The sun is also expected to consume Mercury, Venus, and maybe even Earth if the aforementioned chaos does not occur. But hopefully before then, we will have developed the technology and the means to move on from our home world and find a new place to call home amongst the stars. This was probably more detailed than it was necessary for discussing the formation of our solar system when regards to planetary habitability, but I thought it was important to show how potentially habitable planets could be completely at the mercy of other planets around them. A few minor changes for say, the fifth giant's path inwards could have disrupted the orbits or even collide with the inner planets, and possibly Earth, which would have ruined its chances of developing complex life at an early stage. This is also not a 100% accurate account of what happened. We may never achieve that, as it is the case for many other events in our natural history. But new theories, evidence, discoveries, and work on the subject will at least get us close. This video could be obviously tomorrow, 5, 10 years down the line. Only time will tell. I thought I would split the section on solar systems into two videos, as it will be more accessible for you to learn the relevant parts that you're interested in. So the next video will be looking at what you will need in a planetary system other than our own for the conditions necessary to host habitable worlds. 
hopefully with the understanding of how our own solar system formed from this video, it will give you some insights for the next one. If you think you found an error in my videos, then don't hesitate to comment to correct them. If you also think you'll be useful to others interested in planetary habitability, then by all means share it to them. Thanks for your time, and goodbye.